day if they don't repair. Well, he said for about two and a half to three weeks, the, his skin right in this open region here puffed out, he said about a half an inch. Well, I talked to his wife when I was visiting years later in Chelyabinsk, and she backed up the story. She used her own words, but it backed up the story. She was scared. Some sort of radiation she was concerned about. And eventually, after two, three weeks, it goes back to normal, and there's nothing remaining, by the way, not today. He was very concerned, as you might imagine. And I said, would you be willing to let me hypnotize you? And this is only the second time I've had a pilot agree. And so I'm, in Russian, would you believe, I hypnotized this Russian pilot, the Soviet pilot, and he comes out with more details under hypnosis, which tells me that it's a valid technique, uh, and I can't bias him in any significant way, because I don't know that cockpit that well. Later on, I studied the cockpit and the flight performance of the aircraft, and I can tell you the wavelength transmission of the windows, because I'm concerned of how many seconds he was exposed, assuming it was from that object. Uh, what is the radiation dose falling on the skin that would produce that level of, of effect, even though we don't know what it is? It was edema. It was a water buildup, but we don't understand the hardness, uh, the cork effect, let's call it. Mm. Um, it was a very interesting case from the yeah. Soviet Union. Mm. Uh, one case comes to mind, uh, a pilot and three passengers, two of whom were pilots themselves, were flying from southern Florida up to uh, North Carolina at night in a, a twin-engine propeller plane. And Willie Smith did the analysis with Dr. Hynek years ago. He, the, the two of them interviewed the pilot. Well, they had electromagnetic problems with their VOR, which is part of the, the in-flight navigation system, such that it was drifting them farther and farther out to sea. They were over the Atlantic Ocean at the time. They were about 10 miles off the coast of Florida. And they could keep the land in sight, but there was not much traffic, and it was the air was as reasonable and so forth, smooth. Well, that's the first part of the story, that they're drifting more and more. So air traffic control, I think in Atlanta, calls them and says, where are you going? Correct your flight path 10 degrees left, you know, get back to land, so to speak, because you're drifting further and further. And they check their VOR um, and find that it's correct that is reading correctly, even though the radar from the ground tells them they're in the wrong place, more and more. Well, this happens twice. They have two corrections in flight uh, over about a 40-minute period. Well, at one point, off to the east of them in the dark night sky, they see a light coming towards them, and it's fairly fast, it's fairly bright. They think it's an airplane. So he flashes his, his, his landing lights, which is standard operating procedure, right? Just to signal they see you, because you don't want to have any collision, of course. The object comes towards them on a, uh, a bearing about 40 degrees, about the 2 o'clock position, roughly, relative to their heading. Uh, comes down to their altitude, and the witnesses claim that this was a triangle, an equilateral triangle, whose sides were vertical, if you can think of that. So it isn't a thin triangle, it's a thick triangle, about six stories high, what's that, 60 feet, 70 feet thick, and at least, I forget that the estimate was hundreds of feet side to side to side on the three sides, and a triangular opening in the middle. And the pilot said it was such a huge opening that he was contemplating flying through the middle of this thing to avoid it. The object comes to an instantaneous stop at some unknown distance, but they don't know how far away it was, and reverses 180 degrees and goes off as it has come at a high speed until it's out of sight. Well, as interesting as that case is, that's a non-aerodynamic vehicle as far as I'm concerned. It's not ball lightning. It's not birds. It's not a balloon for lots of reasons. It's not stealth technology, because you'd never build anything but stealth that way. We don't know its, its propulsion. It did not produce a shock wave. In that case, there were no electromagnetic effects as it was near the airplane. Perhaps the earlier effects, we don't know. 
it had very bright round lights uh, like headlights along this 60 foot high uh, front facing it it flew front forward by the way not point forward each of these round lights were estimated to be six feet in diameter and white so you can calculate the, the megawatts that are required to light those searchlights up whatever they are and by the way, I don't think they're portholes and I don't think they're lights. I think they're a direct artifact of the propulsion system. While putting pen to paper has never been a problem for Richard Haynes, the same can't be said of Whitley Strieber. Over the past decade, this most complex of characters has unleashed a mind-numbing series of books on UFOs ever since undergoing a traumatic abduction experience which deeply affected the man. But what, we wanted to know, had persuaded this gifted writer to set aside all talk of UFOs and abductions and instead produce an astonishing new book, warning of impending dangers to the global environment. The subject matter of the new book, which is called The Coming Global Superstorm, is sudden climate change. Um, in The New Scientist of November the 27th, 1999, there is a story about the North Atlantic drift, which is a current uh, that is vital to the weather of Europe. And the, it states that this current is changing its strength because of global warming, and that Europe is liable to get much colder very soon. Uh, a few days ago, there was a violent storm that swept across Europe because apparently of the declining power of the North Atlantic drift. The coming global superstorm is about what happens as these currents that bring warm water up from the tropics fail. And the reason they will fail is that the water in the northern oceans is getting so warm that the heat pump effect between the tropics and the north is ending. And the ironic danger of global warming is not that things will get too hot, but that they're going to get very much colder very suddenly. And the first place at peril is Europe. Uh, th that is essentially the thesis of this book. What was it, what was the catalyst, if there was such a thing, that inspired you to research, if you like, the environment and produce this book? Well, uh, I was writing a book called The Edge with the radio show host Art Bell. We were working on it together when I had a meeting in Toronto with a gentleman who seemed to know a great deal about the way the planet works, including giving me a quick two paragraph explanation of ice ages and the comment he also made was that this was about to happen again. And I took notes while he was talking and uh, it was complex, but I was able to sort them out well enough. And when I sorted them out, I began to realize that what he had described was at the absolute edge of scientific knowledge of, of how the, the process of ice ages has taken place. And it was very interesting, and I could also see that it was a very important warning because things were going to fall to pieces pretty soon, and we really didn't, weren't looking for this, we didn't realize it. So Art and I decided to change the subject of the book and write about this. This gentleman that I met came to my room in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock in the morning, and uh, he seemed as human as you and me, uh, he just was terribly brilliant. And there were many, many other things that he spoke about as well that I thought were richly insightful. It was a marvelous meeting, and that was where it started. Now, there's no mention whatsoever of UFOs or extraterrestrials or anything of that ilk in the book itself. But nonetheless, would it be fair to say that all of these so-called visitations, all of these global events that some label UFO phenomena, some label contact, some label all manner of things, would it be fair to say that all of this has a, has now if you like, you found a meaning 
for this. The, the well-being, the safety, if you like, of our planet um, is uppermost in, 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 in the importance, if you like, of the phenomena or whoever is behind the phenomena. The well-being of the planet and of us is uppermost in my mind. Uh, I have taken from my experiences whatever I could to serve that, uh, including trying to understand whether or not there really are aliens here. Uh, I tried hard to find this man uh, to understand who he was and how he had gotten to where I was in the middle of the night uh, when there was no one except uh, just three or four people who even knew where I was. Um, I was unable to do so. I consider him to be in some way connected with the phenomenon, but I don't know how. Uh, he seemed to totally human. Good evening, Acapulco. Buenas The UFO Congress in Acapulco was a memorable event made all the more so after the Pope gave his personal blessing to the organizers through his close friend and Catholic Church theologian Monsignor Corrado Balducci the same Pope who only a year before had traveled to Mexico City and been greeted not just by millions on the ground below but an extraordinary fleet of spheres which appeared directly overhead No se vaya a acabar la pila. No, son 20 minutos de pila. Ah, bueno. ¿Por dónde van, eh? No los veo. For years, skeptics and debunkers, and indeed some UFO researchers, have poured scorn on the so-called fleets. They insist that the sphere-like objects are nothing more than balloons. However, during our visit to Acapulco, Russell Callahan stumbled across a little-known but crucial fact that belies this argument. Well, here we are putting the final touches to another edition of UFO's Hard Evidence. And uh, just reflecting on what Graham had to say there, the trip to Acapulco was indeed fantastic. It was a, a privilege to be invited there to speak. We actually showed the Mexican people some of the NASA footage that has got people talking across the globe, really, in, by way of a thank you. Um, let's be honest now, Mexico has provided some of the best um, rational UFO footage and, and images and accounts for the last 10 years from anywhere else on the world and it's Jaime Massan who's been instrumental in making sure that this stuff goes out to people um, we've done our bit, we've made sure that people see what Jaime's been presenting now some people will have different feelings on, on some of the Mexican footage for instance um, we saw there Roman Catholic city or, uh, sorry a Roman Catholic country Mexico City alone has 22 million people 98% of those are Roman Catholics and um, the Pope's visit was important and it meant a lot to those people shall we say that the fact that footage was recorded on the day of the Pope's visit isn't surprising um, the Catholic Church as we've seen in, in earlier editions of UFOs Art Evidence and of course in the magazine are embracing the subject in Mexico City. The word UFO is in the, the Vatican's own directory and Monsignor Corrado Balducci um, seems to <laughs> be at ease with the subject with the Mexican people. So much so that when we stood there on the Wednesday night and heard Corrado Balducci deliver the Pope's personal blessing on the Congress and wishing it success and happiness to the people who were there it's a milestone that wasn't talked about anywhere other than in Mexico surely that should make the news you know but that's another story what we're talking about is are these fleets the real McCoy are they balloons 
Are they hoaxes? Are they stars? Well, the stars for me, no. Um, the skeptics seem to hang on to anything and everything that's feasible. Um, 